Today we have Lara Proud from Beyond the Bump Education, uh, based out of Fredericton, um, New Brunswick. And Lara, I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit. <laughs> Fair enough. I am, can you hear me okay? I've got like, yeah, you're good. I'm not you're in good. my full setup. I'm still at work. I've been teaching. So I just, <laughs> A little all over but yeah so my name is Lara I like you said I live in Fredericton um, currently in St. John at the moment but New Brunswick based um, I am a registered nurse and I have been for about a decade and I have absolute love for all things when it comes to like preconception to the whole way into childhood it is absolutely where I just have always felt very passionate. So my background has been varied from labor and delivery to Northern Outpost Nursing in Saskatchewan and Alberta to working in the emergency department. And now I'm doing, um, I'm teaching for our local university, taking nursing students up to our maternity ward, as well as beyond the boat. <laughs> so yes, there's a whole varied thing, but with beyond the boat, um, my main focus is on, I mean, the child safety workshops is where I had started. So I am a heart and stroke CPR instructor. So this information is like based on that, but it is not a certification, just so everybody is very yes, clear. Very um, clear. Um, I hate to even have to do that little thing, but yeah. yeah. It's important. It's okay for this as well. <laughs> Yes. So perfect. So if you'd like to learn more about what it is that Lara does, what it is that we do at Treehouse, click that little arrow above my head today. Follow Lara at Beyond the Bump Education, um, her handle as well as Treehouse's handle, Girl with Treehouse. So let's jump into the topic today. We're talking about CPR. We're talking about gagging. We're talking about choking. A lot of topics that are really relevant. We're going into the summer months now. Kids are going to be home, even the little ones. They're really little ones. So if you have any questions during our IGTV live today, I encourage you to please ask them in the chat. Lara will answer them directly to, um, to you. And uh, if you don't have any questions, but you think that maybe you want to share this content with a colleague that might have some questions, um, we will be saving this and so will Lara. So you'll be able to, to access it after the fact as well. So with that, let's get started. Um, let's talk about choking and gagging. Um, this is a big topic, a really important one. Like I said, we're going into the summer months. Kids are wild sometimes. Well, sometimes, always. And um, <laughs> let's let's unpack this one a little bit. So um, choking and gagging, did you want to maybe give a little bit of a background on maybe some of those early signs and symptoms of when a child starts to gag and choke and what that means? Absolutely. So there is a really common Thing, especially around the all its time but um, a lot of the time we're seeing it way earlier so when babies are first born and they're just filled with mucus especially if you've had a c-section there is a lot of mucus that has not cleared out yet doesn't have to be a c-section vaginal births can be that way too but like basically the faster the birth and the less squeezing the more mucus and things are going to have so you can have this like gaggy kind of choky feeling in as early as newborns. Um, and then especially it becomes very, very pre prevalent, um, I find when people are starting solids. So you get these little pieces of food and baby is like popping them in their mouth. And they do that like open mouth, like, like that yeah. kind of gaggy face. And we all know the gaggy face. <laughs> I try and do it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so they start this gagging thing. And one of the biggest, biggest differences that I want you to understand about the gagging versus the choking piece is gagging, there is still airflow in and out of the lungs. So mm -hmm. when somebody is gagging, they are coughing, they are sputtering, they are able to say like, if it's an older person or a kid, they're like, I'm choking, I'm choking. It's like, well, no, you're talking, so you're not choking, but you could be gagging on something. And it is when that gag reflex is tripped that there's something in there that's irritating it. Um, so really, when you have that gagging, again, like the airway is going to be open, um, they are still able to get that. And more times than not, we find that they're coughing, they're like doing the tongue roll where it's like thrusting the tongue mm -hmm. 
trying to roll that object or whatever it is forward in the mouth, um, a lot of the times babies or like toddlers, they puke too. And I mean, a lot of them as well. Um, but we're way more stubborn and we go and try and hide from people <laughs> as adults. So, um, but the gagging piece of it, what we want to do is like let kids do their own thing. You don't want to touch them. You don't want to interfere with them. Um, now, this is once you're starting solids. When they're littler, you do want to keep a good eye because they just don't have that core strength to really, like, use all of those abdominal muscles, mm. accessory muscles to get something up as easy. So they may need a back blow or they might need you to, like, intervene at some point. But when mm -hmm. it comes to food, this is why we want you to wait until around that six-month mark because right. they all like sitting up independently. Well, it's not the act of sitting up. It's the core strength that actually comes from being able to sit up. So if they're able to sit, they will typically have the strength in order to keep their necks up quite well without slumping or bobbing over. They're able to use those accessory muscles all along, like they're kind of like rib cage and down the sides into their abdomen. And if they start to gag or choke, they can use those muscles to kind of push that up and out. Pull it out towards, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of like gagging for the most part. It really is like, there's more to it than that, of course, and it depends very much like on the type of food and literally just where the gag reflex sits in the mouth because as you start introducing more foods, the gag reflex moves back farther and farther until where it is in our throats when we're adults, right? Mm -hmm. so or introduction of things that you get the farther that that goes back when babies are like starting to put their entire fists and hands in their mouth and they're gagging themselves it's really biologically there for a reason so that they can help to get their tongue moving the way that it needs to and help them really understand that swallowing mechanism well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm few things just from the lactation consulting side of my life, um, tongue ties hugely can impact this. So if you had a baby who was tongue tied, I find a lot of the time um, that gag reflex is way closer. So it's more anterior to the front of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those babies have like a little bit harder time um, with the introduction of solids and things like that that much longer my son was like the perfect example of this and it just was about a month extra that he needed to just be able to sit and have that food like mm -hmm. if it, allowing it to just kind of be there but there was a lot of gagging and a lot of puke <laughs> so, yeah. so let's turn over then to the difference of gagging and then choking um so choking you said does not allow for that airflow to go yeah. in. So let's talk about that. And then we, we'll get to a question from one of our viewers. Absolutely. So um, the choking side of things is when one of the easiest ways that I find that you can tell um, and whether or not you have actually like seen babies start choking, maybe you walked into the room, maybe you had your back turned because it can happen just in a blink. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there is a panic, you know, there is like that panic look and they are trying. So we have this universal, like I'm doing it without even realizing. Yeah. We have this universal choking sign that once you're old enough, you start to just kind of, right? Like you're choking, but babies, obviously they can't do that. Um, but what you find is like, you may hear something, it's called striderous. And it's like this, like a, uh, it's not actual air entry. There's no like lungs are filling up actually working well there is something blocked off right. um, super common things that kids will choke on things like hot dogs that are cut perfectly round apple skins is a huge one because you can take a bite and that bite is the exact shape of their mouth so if there's mm -hmm. on the apple it goes and it sits over the airway and it's like nothing can mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. um and you've got like nuts and things peanut butter that are really sticky and stuff like that so there are absolutely safe ways and on Instagram here like there are some incredible accounts like solid starts and all that kind of thing they even have an app to show how to safely like prepare foods for the different age groups mm -hmm. um, but the choking piece of it becomes very very concerning very quickly and yeah. you can there is there is a gut instinct and you can just tell when someone is choking um they mm -hmm. 
grindery noise, but they will have that panic look um, that their face will go from like the red that you get when you're kind of gagging and like sputtering and stuff becoming darker, like a little bit more purple. They're really fighting to try and like get some air. moving. You'll see them like doing the like head bob thing. Um, Mm -hmm. Try and work every possible muscle to get that out as well. So yes. So we're, we're going to walk through that because that is quite unsettling for a parent or a loved one to watch or even a neighbor or someone that is around. Before we get to that, um, one of our viewers said, my daughter had had a lip tie and she gagged on every bottle. It was so sad to watch. Sure enough, once we had that fixed, the tie went away and everything resolved itself. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, like like Lara said, as soon as you resolve some of those issues, um, it's like night and day. Yeah, absolutely. And just like, yeah. like I know, oh, <laughs> so, but it's one of those things that if you have dysfunction in the mouth, and there's something that you're like, why is this happening? What is going on over and over again? And, you know, baby is consistently spitting up. Like you start solids and they're just, will take nothing. They're spitting up all the time. They're gagging constantly. If you give it about a month or so, and that's still happening and there's very inefficient like food intake, that is definitely one of those times where you're like, let's just dig a little further into this and see if mm-hmm. there's anything else we're missing here. So, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's talk about choking now. Let's get into that. And let's discuss, you know, you your background, um, you're trained in, in, in CPR. And like you said, we've made this very clear. We we prefaced it at the top of the at the top of the hour. This by no means does any sort you know, listening to what Lara has to say does not certify you in any way. <laughs> uh, I will reiterate that to, to viewers. But let's talk about CPR. Um, And not only just CPR, but uh, maneuvers that you can do uh, in the event that your child is choking. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just also so you all know, because of the current setup that I have, we will like I will do it demonstrating standing up right now. This is something you want to be on the ground, stable. And so you think about like a child who's panicking because they're choking. Well, they're still very much awake and they're very much freaking out, right? So they're going to be wiggling and they're going to be moving. You don't want to add an increase in fall onto that already like precarious situation. So mm-hmm. and then just to show you, because I don't have the proper setup like I do at home to get onto the floor and do it. But um, just so you all know, this is something that you would do. You bring baby to you on the floor so you are very stable and have room. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Just again, preface that. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. I've got my little, my little guy here. Um, so basically, when you are, for example, baby is sitting in their high chair and they are eating, and you notice like, oh, okay, they're gagging. Like, this is, you know, maybe one of those times that it wasn't like an instantaneous they gag and it clears right out. What you want to do is just be so calm, be very calm because that baby, like we know, kids feed off of our energy in like two seconds flat. And if we're worked up and scared, they will be as well. Um, So one of the things to kind of keep in mind, if you think somebody is like lunging at you, what's the very first thing you do? (gasps) You're going to pull back, right? (laughs) All right. Exactly. So babies are the same. So we never want to like go running at them and be very stressed out and things because it's going to make them panic, which immediately does a, (gasps) and then they have just lodged whatever it is even deep. So kind of like very quickly go, okay, like you got this, you got this. And the pep talk actually works. Um, As foolish as that sounds, like, uh, especially talking to a dummy right now, it's one of those things that like, the more confidence that you can instill in them, the more Mm -hmm. confident of an eater they are going to be and they know not to panic. So this is something you start right from the beginning, if at all possible, and you're kind of like, okay, you got this, like, get it out, you got this. And you really are slowly like removing the straps from around them if they're strapped into the, the Mm -hmm. um, 
you might take away their tray but again you're doing all these things slowly you're not panicky because they have time lots of these babies especially if you've waited for the signs of readiness before starting solids they have the capacity to clear it on their own the vast majority of the time. So we want to interfere as little as possible because they're going to be more effective than we will be. Mm -hmm. Two, don't stick your fingers in their mouths. <laughs> Our fingers are so big. And if you think about it, baby's little windpipes are about the size of their pinky. So it's very, very small. And the big finger going in there and trying to dislodge a piece of food, chances mm -hmm. are they push it back farther. So like sitting within the gum line so where our teeth are but like they just have the gum line if it's something like within the cheeks you can kind of go ah, and just like pop it out with your finger like a little flick yes. never go fishing okay. <laughs> never go fishing never go fishing. <laughs> um, so when you have baby kind of sitting here you're like got all their straps off and stuff you're recognizing like okay they have progressed past the point of they're just they're not able to clear this. And now the panic look is coming. Their face is getting a darker red. They're really, really working, but it's not coming out. First mm -hmm. thing you do, again, you're taking them to the floor. I'm not taking them to the floor right now, but that, but never go fishing. <laughs> Hashtag, I love it. Um, but uh, yeah, so you're going to take them down to the floor. So you are on a very solid base. You're going to put your hand on either side of their jaw. If you can see, there's lots of room between where my finger and their jaw is because you want them to be able to keep that mouth open. And then you put them over top of your arm like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the tricks that I love to use, and again, these babies are very awake and they're very flaily, so they're not happy this is happening. Take your leg, pop it yeah. in underneath and press it really tight into your body so you have more control. So again, like you would be on doing all of this but for, for our sake there is also an angle I wonder if you can see it well on this mm -hmm. <laughs> go right here where their rib cage is and yeah. that is almost like an arrow you are looking to press there so what we're going to do is actually use the heel of the hand and go down and up a little bit like when you're pressing um and it's going to compress the lung to be able to help pop that object out of their mouth so it's way harder than you think it's gonna be. um i've seen recently some videos floating around instagram of like oh just start slow and go harder as you go you don't want this baby choking any longer than they need to be you start yeah. and the faster that that object gets out of there the better so yeah. it's harder than you think it is you're actually really hitting and what it does is between the two hands, you're compressing air in their lungs and you're helping to put that object up and always have baby's head pointed downward. So you're using gravity as well. So that is one of the choking methods. Like that's the back blows. Mm -hmm. Two is you flip them over after five back blows and you mm -hmm. were going to do compressions on an infant. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll show you kind of what the whole series looks like. And then if there's any questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so while, while you're doing that, I'm just going to speak a little bit while you're doing the demonstration, because while, um, while Lara shows us this, um, she's going to, she's actively showing us how to uh, do some back blows and some basic compressions on an infant. We see two fingers. I'll let you speak about that. Yeah. So back <laughs> Whole fist and you're going to be or your whole hand, open hand and you're going to one two three four five you grab them by the head flip them over again use your armpit to really anchor them in because they're very much awake then you're going to go between the nipple line and just tiny bit down we won't get too technical in this but if you're in PR class you'll get the proper one um in between here down and you're gonna do five compressions one two three four five what you can do in this position especially is you can be looking in the mouth to see if you see that object mm -hmm. far back in the throat again don't go fishing yeah. <laughs> Make sure you see it and it's there 
you can turn them to their side, pop it out with a pinky if it's within the cheeks. Otherwise, you're going to do this compression and back blow or compressions and back blows five times each until baby essentially becomes unconscious. Okay. Um, do you use only two? Uh, do you only use two fingers for the front? And and why do we use two fingers? Why do we not use um, maybe our hand? Fair. Um, with infants, and we're talking like typically under a year. Mm -hmm. They're very, sorry, <laughs> they're very, very small. Um, and you have a lot of strength, especially when your adrenaline is as peaked as it will be while you are doing this. So you don't want to use your entire hand on an infant. If you are doing this on an older child and you're actually doing more of the like Heimlich or the rest maneuver, you're using, you know, your hand and as much strength as you need to actually be effective. Mm -hmm. like, like techniques that you would learn very much in detail taking an actual yeah. course. Um, but you only need the two fingers on an infant to be able to effectively do the compression based mm -hmm. on like, how little um, their bones are very, very, very like, fragile. Like, yeah. they're, they're basically like equated to cartilage at that point when they're that little. They haven't started to harden very much, so it does not take a lot of pressure to actually compress them. Absolutely. So with that being said, then I think, you know, we've discussed a little bit about choking, uh, choking in infants specifically, we've discussed, you know, some maneuvers that parents, uh, or anyone, quite frankly, not doesn't have to be a parent, anyone at that point can help with. Um, and then um, I'm not going to go into the full um, CPR for infants, I think it's really important for somebody, um, if they want to learn more about this to contact you directly to contact beyond the bump because this is not by any means a five to ten minute run through of how to do this this is uh, a skill that everyone should have um, but to take the time to really understand it and this is something that lara um, can absolutely help you with as well but i do want to ask a couple other questions that are relevant to what you just kind of demonstrated to us. Like you had mentioned, uh, you perform this maneuver until the child or the infant um, basically goes unconscious, and then you would have to try to um, start CPR. Same thing goes for an older child. Now, let's talk about when do I need to call 911 or when do I need to go to the hospital? Um, are those two different things? And maybe you can share that with us. For sure. So one of the main ones for going to the hospital and a lot of people, like especially working in Emerge, I've seen so many people like either pre-COVID, of course, like waiting in the waiting room and like starting peanut butter or something in the waiting room for their kids or like sitting in the parking lot so that they're nice and close. Um, allergies is a huge reason why people are incredibly nervous, especially around that starting solids time. So mm -hmm. With the allergy piece, things that you're looking for, speckles or spots around the mouth where the food has touched and they become rashy, any type of swelling of the tongue, any mm -hmm. change to their breathing pattern, rashes down the front or onto their belly. Um, typically, and there is no like set in stone rule when it comes to this stuff, but typically the first exposure to a food is not going to be the most severe. Um, reason for that is basically like every exposure, if you think of it like a bucket, as you fill up this bucket and it overflows with the number of exposures, essentially you're like overflowing your system's ability to handle it. So it sometimes is one exposure and that's all you need to know. And that's, you know, there's an allergy there and yeah. other it's, you know, it takes a while. I mean, my sister's a perfect example at 20 something developed an avocado allergy like it just you never know so it's mm -hmm. I'm a lot of things I talk with about people are the allergies and starting if there are um, very well known very severe allergies in the immediate family so this would be parents um, siblings of the child who have allergies working with your doctor and working with an allergist at that point could be a really, really smart option just to make sure that you're all safe and everybody has, um, you know, covered all of the bases that are needed. But for the most part, unless there's a lot of big red flags, 
it's not quite as necessary. However, allergies become very if you see any of those signs that I had talked about, great to emerge. We don't have to wait because you never know. Um, and then also, I mean, when it comes to choking, a lot of people, do I have to take my baby right away? Like if they were gagging, choking, do I have to go right to emerge? Um, a lot of people choose to, and we never, ever, ever blame you for doing that because we, we get it. <laughs> a lot of us have or something too right so um it completely makes sense it isn't necessarily necessary so if you get the object out things are cleared quite quickly baby was not unconscious they did not get to the point of requiring cpr that mm -hmm. object when you do those initial back blows it is so incredibly effective that most of the time it comes out quite quickly mm -hmm. so probably not necessary but a lot of people like to be checked anyway um, however, if you are doing CPR, that is the point where you would want to be calling for the ambulance. If somebody is there with you, get them to call so there's no interruption to the cycle. But mm -hmm. if it's just you and you actually witnessed the child go from that gagging to choking to now unconscious, mm -hmm. you knew the last time that they were breathing was. So you immediately call EMS or like 911 or whatever mm -hmm. and get help. If you find a child unconscious, you do a full round of CPR prior to doing that because you think like little kids have way less oxygen stores than we do as adults. So the faster, more oxygen into their body, the better off they're going to be. A really good, um, a really good way to really kind of end our discussion. It's about really thinking about the child and how you can help them as quickly as possible. Um, and, and having the knowledge that you've just shared with us is really, really important, especially, like I said, at the beginning of the hour, um, as we move into the summer months, um, people are, are vacationing, people are going to cottages, you have a, a number of maybe neighborhood friends coming by, you might have a lot more children in your driveway or your backyard than you typically have in the winter months, and especially since COVID has opened a lot more doors now for us to kind of go back to living um, you know, pre-pandemic a little bit. So I really, really thank you for, for giving us a really, really speedy introduction um, and by no means uh, even exhaustive of all of the knowledge that someone would need to have. Choking and gagging, two different things. Um, Lara has highlighted that, but there is just so many more elements to this that um, any family member or any parent or anyone, quite frankly, if you are around children, or even if you're not, I think, you know, you could be on your bike going down a bike path and seeing a child having an, uh, an emergency and you should, um, you know, be able to assist at least. Um, so Lara, before we kind of wrap up for today, I wanted to ask you, is there anything that you wanted to share um, with our viewers about this topic um, right now? Just know that if this was a very sensitive topic for you, it is completely normal and completely okay for you to feel very overwhelmed by it. Um, I do offer a workshop that's two hours and like about 15 minutes or so that covers these topics. So it is available online if this is something that you feel like you want to know more about. Um, but I also recognize how incredibly stressful even thinking about this can be for a lot of parents. So if that's where you're at, you know, the fact that you were even listening to this has prepared you more than what you were before. And all you can do is the best in any given situation. So it does help to have some knowledge about stuff prior to. Um, and that muscle memory of actually practicing and doing these skills makes a big difference. But it is normal for you to not want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> so. No, exactly. But I think, you know, just having some, some knowledge and then always just remaining calm and really kind of looking there at, around your surroundings and, and seeing how you can keep that child calm as well. Um, that really helps as well. So um, everyone who's watching today, thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, please give Lara uh, and her team uh, a follow, follow Treehouse. If you'd like to see more content like this, continue following us uh, and please get in touch with Lara uh, to, to learn more today or share this video to someone who uh, may want to get more knowledge on it. Lara, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. 
And we look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.